Um, my talk today is called Food, Shelter, and Community. Uh, this is the distillation of sort of 35 years of being institutionalized in this kind of environment. Um, it comes down to a mantra for a lot of people, often it does, and for me it's food, uh, shelter, and community. Those are the three things that I think are the most important things to know about, the th three most important things to work on, and I'm just starting, as Lisa said, to do things that are uh, reinventing myself. The theme is reinventing, so I'm trying to reinvent myself. This clock came to me from a, my nephew who was visiting Brazil, and I thought it was an interesting way to start because it seems to me that according to this clock, we're kind of on our way to a, a very f sort of si sad time. We're moving towards fatigue fairly quickly. And I think we're, we're very tired of the same old approach to things, the same old approach to the solving political and social problems. So I would like to think that, that using this mantra of food, shelter, and community, um, we can move more towards a sense of awe, perhaps, and more towards a sense of duty and citizenship, and more, more towards a sense of perhaps epiphany at some point, and get away from the anxiety that a lot of us feel as part of, uh, as we live through this economic downturn. Our, our, I don't know how many we've had in the last six years, but it seems about once a year we go through another one. So why food, shelter, and community? Food is essential for our well-being, obviously, and I include air and water in food. There's no question about it. anything that we ingest into our body has to be pure. Shelter because it gives us protection, it gives us a sense of um, just belonging as well, and we need that. We need good shelter. And once you have those two things, you can actually work on community. So they're essential to have food and, and shelter first. So I want to talk today about the commons, because the turn of the commons is something that we have to deal with. As, uh, as academics, but also as people living in the world. Common space is public space, and often we, we think of public space and common space as spaces we move through, spaces we learn in, so schools are public spaces. Um, we have lots of examples, we have parks, we have, uh, you know, you can, you can name a, a million of them. One of them is right here. We are at a university, it's a public space, it's funded by public money. Uh, arenas are public spaces as well. Um, theaters are public spaces. Parks, as I said earlier, are public spaces as well. And so we have to realize that what people value public spaces and common spaces because this is where we meet each other, this is where we dialogue, this is where we exchange our ideas, this is where we uh, you know, help each other. We do it in, in a common space. And that's what the university really should be as well. It's getting better at doing that. The cities are getting better at doing that as well, providing better common spaces. But what happens often, and what we've been witnessing more and more lately, is the turning of common spaces into corporate spaces. So schools are, are turning into factories, as Ken Robinson was telling us. And they've been factories for a while. We have to turn them into something different. Um, arenas are, turned, are turning into... Uh, you know, places for advertising more than they are for fun. Um, we're, we're inundated with uh, commercialized uh, public space theater kind of activities. And we have parks now sponsored by various large corporations for the purposes of making their product more available. So what do we do about that? And, and, and why, how do we get to this time? Well, I want to go back to history a little bit and talk about the commons. The commons was a space that was given to farmers and people who worked for the lords outside of the perimeter, around the perimeter of the, of the castle. And the idea was that in that place, in that space, they could dialogue, they could share ideas, they could most importantly grow their own food. They also had access to um, um, building materials, they could build their own houses. So the commons was a free place. It was a place that everybody had access to uh, and everybody had um, a possible connection to, uh, but it was also about protection as well. So, you know, protection from outside influences, that, that's why you were right beside the, the most powerful uh, entities of the, that were run by the lords, but food production was a part of it as well. Dialogue, of course, happened. And common law grew out of this tradition of people speaking amongst themselves. So the other thing that came out of it was rights. So people had rights in these places, 
rights to the land, rights to inherit the land, rights to um, you know, use the land for their own purposes and develop their own ideas. And so I call this a kind of vernacular space where people spoke to, to each other of the practical things like food, shelter, and community on a regular basis. So what happened? What happened to the commons? Well, the commons turned into the enclosure movement. So in the 17th and 18th centuries, and this is a little bit of a small history lesson, for those of you who probably know this already from grade 10 history, but the enclosure movement was a really important development in the Industrial Revolution, right? So, and in, in the development of capitalism in, in England. So the enclosure movement did things like stop the commons from being accessible to everyone that needed to, to have access to it, and it caused a, 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 a culture of land for profit to emerge, um, and this coincided with, of course, the, uh, um, the development of colonialism. And it, it, the idea was to increase the yield of the land, and to, it also displaced persons, and it caused urbanization, which we talked about earlier as being the most important thing that's happening to us today. So how do we understand the relationship between the enclosure movement and where we are today? Well, the enclosure movement was, was touted as being a form of progress. And by increasing the technological application to the land, you could get to enlightenment. And enlightenment, of course, uh, is what we all want. And enlightenment means two things. It means uh, better ideas, new ideas, and an enlightened kind of lighter kind of thinking. But it's also about relieving us of the burden of being human, which is very ironic when you think about it, that technological advances were really there for us to be not close to the ground anymore, but actually distanced from the ground. So <clears throat> what's resulted is we now have a commons that looks like this. And the irony of this commons, as I don't know if you know this, if you've ever been to the House of Commons, you should all go to the House of Commons because it, it, it does belong to you. The carpet in the House of Commons is green. <laughs> and the reason it's green is to remind us of the original commons, that this was a space that we're supposed to have that is common to everyone, that is used for our purposes to, to, to speak. So parliament is, is a is the French word means to parler, to speak. So it's a place where we speak about what's important to our entire community. But we don't speak there. We as the commons don't speak there. We as the common people don't speak there. We, are, we have people representing us. So one of the tricks of the enclosure movement was that we promise that even though you were giving up your rights to the commons, we'll build a building where you can send someone to speak on your behalf. It's very magical. And I think Eric probably understands it more than anybody um, in the room. But so there's this, you know, they, they stand on the ground, which is supposed to be the ground of Thunder Bay, and they, they talk about Thunder Bay, but they're, they're doing it at a distance. It's really quite a magical kind of thing when you think about it. So what do, what do we do? So the commons has been packaged. Um, we have to react to this. And so many people did react to it. And the distancing that happened for people and the urbanization that happened was met with a fair amount of resistance uh, in, in classical Greece. There's all sorts of examples of land tenure being changed and people resisting it, uh, of course, all through the, the 17th, 18th centuries in, in Great Britain. Um, the Luddite movement is another movement that clearly was uh, based on this idea of replacing workers with technological innovation. Uh, and also, we've had all sorts of uh, evidence in our culture over the last 2,000 years of the military being defending the commons against people in some ways. And we've watched the Arab Spring er emerge as a kind of, uh, I think, reclaiming of the commons in a different part of the world, not based on, on Western democracy at all. It's really quite interesting. I think we don't really understand it, and I hope we, we try to as well. So what happens? Occupation. Occupation happens. And so the Occupy movement is attempting to do the same kind of thing in this day and age. And what we, what we really need to do is fight back. So how do you fight back in the face of this corporate kind of culture that is omnipresent, that's everywhere that we look? It's, 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 all a, it's a logo-centric environment, as Naomi Klein would say. Um, so how do, we, how do we deal with this? Well, 
There's one more idea I have to mention. That's the tragedy of the commons. It's, this was a, an ecologist named Garrett Hart in 1968 uh, described the tragedy of the commons as uh, the depletion of natural resources by just using them in a, in a kind of industrial way uh, and that we are responsible for ruining our own commons. And the, and the way we have to get out of it is to reclaim the commons in a way that's going to be beneficial to everyone. Well, what happened? Uh, with the reaction to the tragedy of the commons was the ecological movement, the environmental movement came into the, into, into the fore. But also at the same time, another group of, of very loud speakers came in, uh, some economists who said, we have ruined the commons by overfishing, overconsumption. You know, we knew them. You've heard this before. Irresponsible farming. And these are people like people at the Fraser Institute and uh, uh, there's another one coming up, the C.D. Howe. Institute, which is, has its roots in Thunder Bay, ironically. Um, but the answer, though, is increased privatization. The only way to care for land, water, and air is to privatize everything. So my answer to this, though, is that it's not for sale. Our commons, the one we have left, is not for sale. Our water is not for sale, and our air is not for sale either. What we have to do is occupy capitalism. How do you occupy capitalism? Well, you try and change it from within. People live with money. People live with, uh, you know, they have to have a certain amount of money to live. So we're not going to destroy capitalism overnight, but what we're going to do, and I'm not talking about a Marxist revolutionary moment here. What I'm talking about is a, a different approach to understanding what's common to us that's based on old principles. And those old principles are sharing ideas in a common space with people like this. This is a commons. We're doing it right now. And so... We need more of this, but we also need to feed ourselves. So back to food. So the turn of the commons uh, is required because we now have this incredible corporate, uh, an obese corporate mentality, which is exemplified here by a fairly ugly rendition of, <laughs> even uglier rendition of Ronald McDonald, um, but also by companies like Monsanto, who we all despise. I know all of you do secretly despise Monsanto. And I love this, this slide because it says, no food shall be grown that we don't own. And this is the future of food for all of, a lot of us. And we don't even know what's happening, that Monsanto has more patents now on seeds and other elements of the food system that it would frighten you if, if I could list them all, and I won't. Um, then we also have this concept of food ink. I'm sure you've seen the movie. If you haven't seen the movie, you should. Um, that our, corporate, our food system has become corporatized to the point of just absurdity. Um, most of which you probably ate here, but although this, this institution and this, this uh, actual place here, um, the outpost, has a mandate that's not connected to a corporate environment at all, and they do use local food, and if you look on the wall there, they have a little sign that says they've been championed for using local food as much as possible, which um, I'm very happy about. Uh, but then you also have the Wonder Bread, and you have also chemical spraying, so what do we need to do about this? How do we turn the commons? How do we get that back? Well, we, we have to do things like this. We have to eat at home. Imagine eating at home. I mean, the thrill of going out for fast food is just amazing, isn't it? But eating at home can be quite an interesting experience, and I think most people should learn how to do it again. We can also learn how to garden again. And this is about reinventing myself. I, when I lived in Thunder Bay, I had nothing but garden in my property. Um, and unfortunately, when I left, in order to make the property useful to the next people that use it. I had to take the garden out. But what I did was I actually had, went on Kijiji and I gave all my plants away. So my plants are all over Thunder Bay right now. It's a lot of fun. Um, the other thing we have to do is eat locally and think globally. We have to become global citizens. We have to understand the global commons, that we're no longer isolated from each other. So we do have the access today with this kind of means to you know, talk to each other and of, uh, you know, large numbers, um, but we also have the capacity to eat locally. So I urge all of you to really understand where your food is coming from, and as Michael Pollan says, be conscious of every single thing that you put into your mouth. Now his answer often is, you know, be an individual who can forage and hunt, and it just isn't really that practical. So we have to find ways that are more practical. But we have to also get away from spraying our food and get away from the petrochemical industry that's that's really at the heart of our food system. And we have to bake our own bread. <laughs> we have to learn how to bake. We have to learn how to cook. 
So we, in talking about revolutionizing education, we need to, to bring back into the schools the capacity for home economics, as it used to be called, or, or family living, or when I was a kid, there were all sorts of things like that. And in Berkeley, which was mentioned earlier, and Berkeley's always the font of everything, it seems, um, and uh, they passed a city ordinance that says they, they cannot uh, build a school without a kitchen in it. They cannot build a school without a garden beside it. They cannot do anything unless it's gonna be good for the community. So when I say food, shelter and community, it's got to be something that's always good for those three things, or else it's worth talking down, or talking against, or talking up if it's good. So, what can you do? You can do su community-supported agriculture, community gardens, school gardens, I mean, you, and I'm going to go into a little more detail about some of these. Um, the last one is what I'm going to talk about is the food court, which is something that's sort of in my, in my future, hopefully. And there's guerrilla gardening and seed bombing. But what you do have to do all the time is put yourself in the picture. You must put yourself into the picture all the time. So these are things I've actually done. They're very simple. Learned how to garden, learned how to cook. So let's talk a little bit about, I'm just going to show you a little bit about one thing that I think I'm very proud of, and that's the good food box. And in fact, yesterday, I started the food box in, uh, in Aurelia at Lakehead University after listening for six months to people say, I wish we had a good food box here. And all I did was drive down, get the good food boxes, and drive back to the, to the, the campus, and 25 people got their good food boxes, and they were thrilled. They said, this is, what, this is what you get for $10? This is what you get for $15? It's very simple. So the good food box is a perfect example of sharing, of getting good, local, sometimes organic food in the summer, which is great. Uh, guerrilla gardening, if you've never heard of it, please go to guerrillagardening.org. It's basically finding spaces in the community that are ugly and empty and filling them up with beauty. It's really easy to do. Most guerrilla gardeners do it at night. Uh, <laughs> fruit tree reclamation is one of my favorites. We did this in Victoria, where they actually take the fruit, distribute it, and they also make uh, wonderful uh, cider out of it, and it comes back to the organization that sponsors this. Um, and then also community-supported agriculture, which you can see brings smiles to little kids' faces because they believe it's their farm, and that's where our food comes from. And you can go to the farm uh, and, see the, and meet the farmer. And finally, this is what I really want to do, is go to a food court and have a court, and have judges and have nutritionists and sit down and have all of the food come to the table and have it be sampled for its you know, nutritional quality, which we all know is suspicious. So finally, thank you very much, and that's how I finish. Thank you. Sorry.